Fox is here. Good morning to you. G'day, Kane. Looking fit. Oh, mate, I just went to the gym this morning and I feel like I, uh, I'm i 100 years old. My lower back is screaming, but um, yeah, doing something a little bit different after 15 years of nothing. Well, I'm interested in that. Now, mm. I'm, assu- uh, I'm sure. Because you're, you're, you're a tank, mate. Yeah, no, I'm definitely not. <laughs> you said you're, you're back in the gym lifting weights. Yeah, no, it's strange. <laughs> like, I've, I've had no inclination to do that at all since retirement in 07. But um, yeah, just doing something different, I don't... I think it's good to to change it up, and it's as good for the mind as anything. But yeah, I'm I'm with a group of about six or seven guys that are doing this lifting. I was talking about it with Gary yesterday, and they, th- these blokes that are just you know real estate agents yes. or stockbrokers, <laughs> and and they're I'm getting outlifted easily, and these guys are very proud of themselves. Are you competitive? No, no, yeah, no. Okay. I'm not. I'm not concerned about that as such. I'm just happy to to be moving and to do something but i'm the place is called gripped it's down in in um, paran behind jam factory there and they've you know it's a bit of a there's a subculture that mm. that i never knew was there but you know people that are getting there early in the morning so i'm we're at six o'clock 45 minutes you hit it you're out Bang. five times a week it's um it's it's very different but it's yeah it's, it's stimulating go for it mate you got to get there bucks i have not lifted a weight retired in 2015 i don't think i've lifted one since it's as confronting you can, as you can tell and i i would be embarrassed it is I, confronting yeah. but in the end it's it, it's you against yourself yeah, and that's that, true. i mean even when you're in a in a football environment it's it's you against yourself first and foremost you just got to be a better Mm. Yeah, you know, improve yourself incrementally as you go along, and then eventually you've got to go in and you've got to beat the guy that you're playing against, or be a part of a team that is going to beat the best. Mm. But it fundamentally starts with you against yourself. I do love that. Uh, let's talk some footy. It feels like the St Kilda situation is bubbling away. Um, you know, we've we've spoken about it last night on on the television, as did all the football shows. But the Alistair Clarks and the Brett Ratton contract now disagreements between players and the the bad press that comes with that, and the on field performance. More importantly, mm. when you're flying, you're eight and three. Things are going so well, and then it gets derailed mid season. Have you got a strategy to how to get that back? as a coach and sort of halt that momentum? Well, there's no doubt that you don't plan to lose three games mm. in a row, especially after I thought St. Kilda exceeded expectations. They definitely exceeded my expectations and they started the season pretty well. And I thought, well, that was, that was interesting, but I, I don't, I think there's a few elements they're missing out on. I didn't think they had enough intercept defenders, but battles stood up. Yeah. Howard stood up. They've actually done really well. Wilkie's, Wilkie's had an, been good, an, yeah. an amazing year. So, and they and they just kept going, and they pl- started. They were playing really good footy against really good teams, and winning, mm. you know, their fair share of those. The Brisbane game was dour up there, straight out of the bye. They didn't look like they were going to win, and Brisbane aren't flying either. So that that sort of is a bit of a red flag when you look back. That's a red flag. The Essendon game was poor. Mm. Um, and Sydney, I thought, looked really sharp early. Like, they were up and about, but, and, and St Kilda weren't able to find the intensity that we normally expect from them. So what do you do? Then there's some, they're a little bit off-field stuff, and then we yeah. sort of say, okay, well, the coaches, you've, you've, you've put your flag in the ground about the coach, and you're going to back him up, and then someone mentions Alistair Clarkson. <laughs> and then the media, like, this is where you need to acknowledge the media as an influence on your – your situation because it does seep in as much as you try and control the four mm. walls, it does seep in. So when you say you need to acknowledge the media, what do you mean? Well, I think we have to acknowledge that it has an impact on momentum, both positive and negative for teams. So Subconsciously or you actually address it? As no, a no, I don't think you address it. I think you just need to be aware that, that it, that with Twitter, mm-hmm. um, and social media as it stands now, you, you, I don't think that you can, you've got to be cognizant of the fact that your people, your staff, your players and their loved ones, their family and friends mm-hmm. are going to be a part of this, of New the, media. the world, yeah, yeah. the world, which is the speculation and innuendo. And we're trying to unpack why things are, how they are. So Carlton play St Kilda this weekend and you couldn't have teams at more polar opposite ends of that spectrum and the media pushes you to one end or the other. Yep. Either things have never been better, they're perfect, everyone's, everyone's brilliant, couldn't be, couldn't be uh, going any better flying or couldn't be any worse. Yeah. 
and let's 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 find the reasons why things couldn't be could, um, are as bad as they can possibly be. So we've got two sides at the opposite ends of the momentum spectrum, mm-hmm. and we've been pu- and they've been pushed to polar uh, opposites. That doesn't mean that Carlton are going to win. It it does help. It it helps because it, we all like mm, to have good. our best stuff re- um, reflected back to us, and we're all really challenged by our worst being reflected back to us, and that's. To be able to handle that is to understand what the modern environment is, and it's the co- it's a coaching challenge, and it is a, a character challenge at both ends. Mm. Because if you get carried away with yourself in Carlton's shoes, eventually you'll drop off. And if you if you can't see your value and your qualities when everyone else is telling you that you're bad well, then you're not going to be able to build yourself out of where you are in St Kilda's shoes. So from a coaching perspective, how much strategy goes into comments that, you know, I'll paraphrase here, but Brett Radden against the, uh, after that St Kilda performance said it was their worst of the year and they, he highlighted the 38 tackles and the, the yeah. lack of, you know, the way that they wanted to play. The, the, so the strategy to go public with that and, and, you know, your players are listening when you're talking always and then to not get a response. It feels to me that that yeah. backfired. Is it, is that you just talking honestly after a game and just calling it as you see it, not thinking about the ramifications of that, or is that strategic to say, well, if I say this and highlight the lack of physicality and the tackles and our worst performance of the year, I'm going to get a response. What happens when that response doesn't come? Yeah, well, I thought I thought Sydney were really sharp early in the game. And St Kilda weren't. They didn't come out like pop guns. They mm. they they were thereabouts. But I thought Sydney were really sharp and. We, the, there was three goals. There was a couple of late goals in that first quarter for Sydney, but it, it was it was one goal each for a fair portion of that first quarter. Yeah, and it only at half time it was only four goals to two, sixteen points of difference. So it wasn't as if there yeah, there was a huge margin mm. in the game. But the third quarter was where Sydney took a hold, and St Kilda could not go with them. So let's break that down. I mean, it wasn't as if St Kilda got blown out of the water early. Mm. Um, but as a coach. I think you when you when you're going well and you do have momentum, you have a greater willingness to challenge the top end of your group or the 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 limits of your group because you've been able to find that often enough. So you'll go, no, no, this is under, mm. this is under what we're capable of. It's only in retrospect that you look back a week later and go, well, maybe I just need to build the group. Maybe they need a little bit more support than a challenge, in in this situation. Yes. Um, but that's only you can you can generally only see that in in retrospect because we Vossi you know, so two weeks ago Vossi's going nuts at his players saying this is you clearly this you, is not do you like that well I do I loved it yeah but it, you know that can happen without the cameras catching it yeah, too so we, we we sort of we put a greater emphasis on things that we see mm. and then we go okay well this is this is a pivotal moment we have just captured here a pivotal moment in the development of this group. Where we're, where we're looking at 0.001% of what actually happens. There's a perception, though, that the, the new player, it doesn't happen as often, of that, that real strong feedback. New yeah. coach? Yeah. So the new, the modern player, yeah. there's a perception that they can't handle it like they used to. Well, there's no, there's no doubt the, co- the coaching um, environment has changed, and it's less fire and brimstone, yep. and it's more teaching. Mm. So... That is that does happen less often. So when we see it, when it pops up out of the surface, it's still there. But when it pops up out of the surface, we go, "Oh wow, you know th- that's exceptional." Mm. And it's it, it's probably not exceptional, but we've captured a moment, and then we put greater significance on it because we can see it, and because we all talk about it. But if you go back to that, and you go, "Okay, so Vossi's he drew a line in the sand, and said, look, 'Look, we're going well, but we but that that third quarter is not acceptable.'" Not where we're and, and we're paraphrasing mm, here, mm, and we're assuming mm, what he's yeah. what he said too. He might have just had a bad day, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he's put his line of sand. He goes, "No, I, I believe, like largely to the point of I would suspect it would be we are we're better than this. Mm. We've we've fallen asleep. We've gone away from X, Y, Z things that we know make us great. So that's what we're going to focus on the next thirty minutes. Simplify it. Bang, bang, bang. Because when we do that, that's where." And that takes mm. effort and it takes energy and it takes all of us. So let's see what we can do with that. So then Carlton go, yeah, finish the game off well, have a couple of other good performances. You can go back and say, well, that was a the moment. catalytic moment. And it might have been. 
They, 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 they've put their most significant sort of four-quarter performance together in Vossi's words last week against Fremantle. Mm. Just the same way as you go back and go, okay, well, Rat's challenging his group and saying that the energy wasn't there and we need to be better. And then you get a pop gun, potentially mm. a pop gun response. You go, okay, well, maybe he pulled the wrong trigger. But it's they're only one. There are moments that we're putting significance on that may or may not have been the difference because there's you know, out of the twenty four seven cycle, we're talking about a, a thirty a twenty second comment or a thirty second moment, and moments are significant. But potentially we put greater significance on them because we don't see the whole raft of. Um, actions that take place. Nathan Buckley is in the studio. We're talking about the Saints and their plight at the moment. Uh, I just want uh, to ask you one more thing on St Kilda before we move on to some other matters. You're you're in the coach's box or you're coaching from ground level and your team is just struggling to move the footy mm. from defensive half. And that was highlighted on the call. I think you were in the Fox footy studios. You would have been watching as well. It just stood out. They just couldn't move the football either. Sydney had a plan to shut them down mm. and St Kilda had no method with how they wanted to transition the ball. And it was all long down the line, straight lines and, and nothing threatening. That wouldn't have been the plan going in. Now, Brett Ratton is, is one of the more aggressive yeah. coaches. He wants his player to, to, um, to take it on. So did you, did you think that Sydney defended particularly? Yeah, well? I, I thought they, well, it's, it's really difficult just from on the TV screen, but when you get the behind mm. the goal shots, you're like, well, I actually don't know where you would go with the ball there. They're either too, uh, too slow and Sinclair gets shut down. Brad Hill's not in the side, so your personnel gets taken out of it a little bit. But my question is, when you're in the box and that's happening, is it impossible to change at mid-game? Like, well, what, can you, what can you do? Is, is game day coaching, in essence, a little bit overrated with that work is done in the preseason, in the lead up to the game, and there's not a lot you can do mid-game to change that? Or the, the one, the... The avenue that that um, Ratton has had and that St Kilda have had often is um, yeah move Brad Hill yeah <laughs> so he yeah. didn't have that lever to pull it wasn't there and Sinclair but, was shut down uh, yeah and, and that was yeah I mean and and even that's good coaching so if you know if Brad Hill's not in the mm. side and I mean obviously he's high forward but as it, but has obviously played wing and high back that gives them that bounce at times Ben Long has played that role periodically but Sinclair's been the most consistent guy so. If you're missing one, and then that just means you can, if you can cut the the head off that guy who's going to give them the bounce. And St Kilda rely on you know that aggressive early ball movement, mm. which is clean hands inside first and foremost. You need to execute a couple of handballs to get a player out in space, and then you speed then your game speeds up off that. Sydney were too strong inside. They mm. were they were too good at winning that. I think Sydney, when I see them do this, which is clean hands, bang, 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 and they're out, mm. they're as sharp as anyone when they get going, and they look like they're on to me early. So that was always going to be a, a tough game for St Kilda to win, given the Sydney that we saw turn up. Yeah. Um, but yes, the, the intent to go is one thing, and then the execution of that is another. Because if you don't put two or three possessions together, you can have the intent of going quickly, but there's no efficiency and then you become dour mm. because you just can't put chains of or, or the opposition's pressure is good and you can't put chains of possessions together to put a, what looks like an organised offence and, and an intent to go. St Kilda, will, they will try and go really fast against, against Carlton and they'll take the game on mm. and we'll see trigger hands and we'll see them trying to cover lines. Now, whether that actually lasts to our eye and whether it's sustainable will be a matter of executing yeah. their their plans and not just the intent of it, but the execution of it. The other team that's under pressure and have been all year is is Essendon. Um, we, we've been speaking a little bit about coaching strategy and what you say publicly versus what you say behind closed doors. It was a couple of weeks ago that Ben Rutten challenged Jake Stringer or, or, or was pretty open and honest about the game that he had played and, and said that it was poor and he needed to be better. Mm. The report was that Jake Stringer wasn't happy with that and he'd spoken to Ben Rutten about that. Now, Ben was asked after the game about it. He wouldn't divulge clearly what was said behind closed doors. But once again, the strategy to publicly challenge one of your players versus doing it behind closed doors. So last night we had the discussion, um, Hutchie saying, well, Brad Scott wouldn't, sorry, Chris Scott wouldn't do that publicly or Damien Harbick wouldn't challenge one of his better players publicly. I had no issue with it. What is going through your mind as a coach when you think about doing that publicly versus challenging the behaviour and the performance behind closed doors? 
I think the the general rule of thumb is to is to have the hard conversations in private and to support yeah. in public. I think that's the general rule of thumb. Um, coaches are human, and and they feel the pressure and the expectation as much as anyone does. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we're and we're emotional beings. If you if you not in the when you're in the cut and thrust and it. If it doesn't mean something to you, well, then you're not in the right place. So you have a drive, you have an ambition, um, and you want to succeed. So when you're not getting that performance, um, you, you have to you carry that with you. The senior coach probably carries it, it well, definitely carries it more than mm. anyone, more than any of the players even, because he feels responsible for every single person, every single play, quarter, you know, win and loss. Um so if he sees uh, if and I'm speculating here, but if he sees a player that he feels that has that is the gap between what their best is and what we're producing at the moment, yeah. and we've had these conversations and we're, we're trying to cajole him along, and it might be a very conscious thing to say, well, the next the next challenge is to publicly rebuke, and that might be that might have been the tenth step along the way. But it's you know I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and prickle him here, prickle his ego, and and challenge yeah. him publicly. Now that doesn't mean it's gonna work, um, but it might be the last resort before being dropped, for instance. Yeah, as I said, I didn't have a major issue with the way that he handled that across the board, Ben Rutten. Did, did you ever say anything? I'm I'm asking you a question without notice here, mm. but publicly that um, a player was unhappy with, and it, and you felt like you heard speaking publicly about a performance and then that player may, it may have damaged the relationship between you and him or, um, nothing, was, nothing that comes to yeah. mind. Um, I think as a, as a young coach, I think you are more, and, and you learn as you go along, but I, I think you probably, you probably feel like, um, you're entitled to speak more publicly around the, to challenge, yes. um, a, a a, a player, the one that I mean, I only spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. So there was one where I came down uh, out of the box and 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 physically grabbed Jared Wits and That's shook right. him. Um, and there was some conversations that came out of that. And and that was a largely my. It was it was very conscious and very um, measured in in terms of wanting to get down and see Wits because we'd had conversations along about just believing in himself and and being the aggressive player that he had, that he had in him, but he played, he plays it as a young man, played a little bit like a, a teddy bear, just not with that lack of confidence and mm. belief about himself. And he's still grown into his body too, big body to grow into. And it was a little bit about, um, you know, mate, this, this is the aggression, you know, th- what we, what we just saw then, we can't have that. You know that you're better than that. So it was very public. So there was, um, and it's not not dissimilar to a coach talking, you know, so mm. Rutten having a crack at Stringer. So there was some unpacking to do there, um, and and to say like to the question was, would did unpacking publicly or personally with no, him? Well, per, no, well, really, it's it's here. It's one on one first. Mm. I mean, mm. that the the the, mo- the main point here is the relationship between player and coach, um, player to player, coach to coach. I mean, they they're the relationships that matter. Mm. What what's happening externally? People can have their opinion of what they've seen, and they can have opinion of right or wrong. But without the context that the player, that the two people that are in that relationship have, yeah. that's largely irrelevant. But you need to acknowledge it because in this modern mm. world, this is what it is. So Witsy would have got a whole heap of questions from his mum and dad, mm. from his mates, from teammates. Like what went on there? Like the, the, you got to answer yeah, all those questions. Yeah. So it's it's a very real thing. When it's when there is vision of it, or when people uh, don't have all of the context, but so for Witsy and I it was to sit down and, and speak about it, and I thought I said I apologise that it was so public, but that's like a, mm. a, a faux apology, isn't it? It's a faking, a, a fake <laughs> apology. But I mean, I I wouldn't have been as I wouldn't have been as concerned about it if it didn't wasn't caught on camera, and I reckon we would have what we would have had to have done to check in on each other and me to check in on yeah. Witsy first and foremost would have been different if it wasn't caught in, in vision. Would you, do, would you have done that to, it was, was it knowing your player? Like, well, I would think, that, would I that think not have worked with some others at Collingwood at the time that might've been a bit more sensitive to and, it? And I think that's, that's part of it as well. So if, if Essendon, 
for whatever reason over the last three or weeks, three or four weeks, had turned their form around. And I'm not sure that Jake Stringer would be a part of it, but mm. he's not all of it. Mm. There's plenty of other things that that aren't necessarily working the way that they would like it to work. But we 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 sort of like if you're in a winning so if um, if Chris Scott does do it, or if Damien Hardwick does have a crack at it, at, at someone, or right now if Vossi gets nuts, it's like because the momentum's going well and because you're winning through it, you're the guru, you yeah, are the doyen. Yeah. If it's not, if you're not getting the end result and you're not getting the chemistry right in your group and you feel like you're not meeting expectations, well, then you're clearly flawed. So the truth is somewhere in between. We create these martyrs. Mm. And we create, the, the, you know, and often senior coaches are the ones. They're either they're either martyrs and they're messiahs, or they're just no good. Uh, <laughs> the reality is, the reality is always somewhere in between. And we and we and we try to unpack and get to the end on it at all. But um, you know, what I would say is that Jake Stringer's got a chance to answer for his and he form needs to and his energy. So the, if we we sort of we've spoken around it, but the the. The, Responsibility um, is on the player. The central yeah. point is that Jake String is not displaying the intensity or the attitude that is going to help him play at his best and help his team win. And that and that, that is absolutely spot on, and and you are, you are correct with that. Sonia Hood, the president of North Melbourne, released a really strongly worded letter to the members last night. Now she has expressed the frustration. Um, with the football department. This was a, a, a release she um, made after round eight. She said uh, the performances haven't improved. The frustration has grown. Um, there has been no discernible improvement and patience among the supporters and members is understandably wearing thin. We knew it would be hard, but the extent of our losses is deeply concerning. Um, she met with Jeff Walsh yesterday. He's going to join the football department in an advisory role and will be embedded in the football department over the next month. Jeff has been tasked with helping us to understand where the change um, is working and where it is not. It's pretty strong, Bucks. No discernible improvement, frustration growing, and Jeff Walsh has come in. It's a tough gig, this coaching stuff. It is. Bucks. It is, and, and there's obviously a, a, it's when you're on the outside looking in, you, can, you know that things aren't coming together the way that you believe they should. And, and that's not to say that North Melbourne were going to be a top eight side mm. this year, but – you are looking for um, buy-in from the players and a consistent thread of method on field and a, consi a, a consistent attitude and effort. So yet we haven't seen that from North. And an external person like and it's such an experienced person like Jeff Walsh going in is it. I mean, you said it doesn't read well mm, for mm. So David or, Noble no. or any or anyone in the football department really at this point. Now there 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 will be some people in there that are just uh, that are working their butts off to support the playing group. And there'll be players in there that are so intent mm. on being a part of a, a great team unit, but it just, it's the right doses in the right ways, you know, to, to put the right skill set together. And while she will go, it goes in as an outsider. What so, will he bring? What well, he, he fresh eyes and experience is, is the main, the main ones. Now he, while she ended up doing a review at the end of seventeen, he'd he'd been out of Collingwood and then come back mm. came back in with fresher eyes, but knew knew everyone pretty well. And in the end, um, you know, I was lucky to be rat uh, fortunate enough yeah. to be ratified through f from what he saw. He thought, okay, well that that's not the issue. We've got some issues here, here, and here. We made some adjustments and we popped pretty quickly. How did you cope with that? I, I was I was actually I welcomed it because yeah. I okay well I. If there's something that I need to do better, well, then tell me about it. If, and was there? If the club, um, with, with Walshy was, his thing was, was less is more for me. And that was a, that De was a consist more? consistent theme. Uh, yeah. Well, it was, it was delegating. Um, well, I was, I was already doing, I was already doing a lot of it pretty well, but it was just picking my moments to, to get in front of the group. So we probably, probably wound it back to, you know, I say if I was presenting three times for 10 minutes, mm. 10 minutes at a time, and an occasion was to wind that back to one a week. Right. So that's something as simple as that book in the week and, and, and let the coach. So take the one out of the middle, let it, let a, a senior coach or a senior assistant or a line coach take that and pull out and, and then, 
bookend the week. Mm. So that was that was something that I worked at with worked with Walshy and we and got some bang for buck and then you sort of go, okay, well, let's keep and let's establish that. But it's one of a thousand things that you shift and change. But what Walshy will provide will be fresh eyes and he, what he will be to Sonia Hood and the board and for Ben Amafio is an experienced old head who's seen good programs and poor programs, who's worked with people that he thinks are effective and people mm. that he thinks mm. aren't. Um, and, he'll, and he will give them his opinion. That's all he can ever do is give them his opinion. So he will now have to create relationships really quickly, mm. sit down and, and have conversations with people and try and unpack a little bit about how they feel, about what's working, about what's not. Where the where the good things are that might be you know might be sitting um, under a whole heap of muck, yeah. and where the muck needs to, needs to be swept out. So that when you put someone like that in, you put a lot of stock on their feedback. So largely now, North Melbourne's the decisions that North are Melbourne are going to make are in Jeff Walsh's and hands. and he's not coming in to make no changes. That, that's where you you get nervous. Well, it's not it's not just the change you make. It's the it's the change you don't make that mm. is important. Mm. So these are the things that we that, that are actually we can build off. And if you change that, well, then you're going to be even worse. Things can be worse. Mm. Mm. You can give yourself less chance of success. So now it's just a matter of saying, what do we keep? What what do I see here that works? And what do we keep? And what do we need to change? Bucks off the temper text. They want you at North Bucks. Would you consider coaching North Melbourne? Um, come on, Bucks, come to North now that Dennis is gone. I'm not sure what that's uh, alluding to. I oh, know they think that um, you had a. Well, obviously, everyone, everyone's got great memories. Thirty years ago, <laughs> I, I could have gone to North, and I should have been a Premiership player, and like all of these uh, alternate realities that have been accepted as fact. But no, I'm not. Um, I'm not in the, in the coaching uh, space. Let's talk about the pies because the issue with the ruck stocks now is is important. Because I know you flagged. Um, Darcy Cameron weeks and weeks ago on the player that he could potentially be. Now his mm. potential, you, you are being justified in that. What do you do with Grundy when he comes back? This is the elephant in the room at Collingwood. There, there, it, it is, and it will persist um, because right now, um, yeah, the setup is working really well, and 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 Collingwood are in in good form. They're in really strong form. They're, they're, that calf is holding up really well. They have. Um, a really strong midfield, and and they've and they've got some dynamic scoring up um, you know, mm. youth that's mm. coming through. But the the ruck role in particular, like Coxie's played better footy. Um, now Coxie's a forward who can who who, who is who is a perfect second ruck mm. really. So he's he, that's his role. Darcy Cameron's a number one ruckman, and Brody Grundy's a number one ruckman. Um, at various stages, we looked at. Yeah, you know, if Brody rucks for eighty five percent of game time and then he rests for the the rest of it, that's okay. Then Darcy Cameron has to be a seventy percent forward who yeah. rucks for for fifteen or or a less. But you, it's not like Max Gorn and Luke Jackson, for instance. Those two guys have both proven that they can go forward, that they take marks, and that they impact as forwards, yep. and they hit the scoreboard, or they create spills for their uh, ground level players. Darcy Cameron has, has done that a little bit. Broads, we have tried to play him as a forward. With and limited it, success. Yeah, yeah. It hasn't, the penny hasn't dropped yet. That doesn't mean it can't, but the penny hasn't dropped yet. Um, he's probably a little bit more free form, you know, likes it through the midfield, creative yeah. um, positioning and a possession getter than he is um, the structured sort of down the line sort of tall forward. So it's not as if it hasn't been attempted, and that doesn't mean it's not going to work either because it takes time and things have to come together. But right now, Collingwood are looking in shape, in form, roles are, roles are established. Darcy Cameron as the number one ruckman, Mason mm. Cox as the, as the forward who pinch hits. When... If and when, and it will happen, Brody is fit and ready to go, the decision the coaching staff needs to make is going to be really interesting. It's a, And, I mean, the contract does play come into it, doesn't it? Like, you can't have – I don't think you can have a guy with five years left at, at five million not playing or playing a bit part role. He would want to be the guy. 
Well, mm-hmm. of course he would want to, but the, the short answer so is... So what's the conversation you're having with him? Do, the short, the, the short answer now. is, of course you can. That, that you don't have, nothing has to be a particular way. List management and the way that contracts are set up and what players are on mm. is, is not relevant to, to putting your best team out in the park this week. So do you have that conversation with Brody Gunny now about how you're foreseeing his role when he comes back in and I guess broaching that with him? Um, I'm not sure whether would, they... Would, would you? Um, or would you wait until... I, I mean, they're, they're, they're a, that's an uncomfortable conversation to take to take yeah. place. Now, Darcy Cameron could injure himself Correct. next yeah. week and, you know, all of these hypotheticals that you throw up are irrelevant. Mason Cox, you know, might mm. go down and there's no there's no real depth. Yeah, outside of Brody Mychek, who just is a battering ram and keeps mm. – and he's an undersized key forward, but he's very effective key forward. And then Coxie, there's no one underneath that for, for Collingwood. So at the moment, you know, those they need all hands on deck in terms of tall stocks. So – Brody Grundy's coming in with a guy who's performing the number one ruck role really well and always had the capacity to, and we have played him in that role mm. at times. We've tried to go 50-50. The Collingwood have tried to go 50-50 with Cameron and and, and um, Brody at times. Um, but that dynamic is is going to evolve. Is going to, and oh, But I don't, I don't know what Craig McRae will do. I don't know what the coaching staff will do. Do they have – do they look at the short term and say, no, we actually like our mix at the moment and Broads, you got to come back through the twos? Mm, mm. Or do they say, um, no, we want to, we want to give it another run. We want to give it another run with trying to play Cameron and Grundy as 50, 50 first ruck and give them 25, 30% each as a forward and see if that works for us. Yeah. And Cox goes out. Uh, they're, they're, that dynamic becomes really important. But one thing I would suggest is that it's really hard for the contract and the list management part of it not to be a part of the decision and a part of the Agreed psych because because we all have egos and and you know if if you ask Brody to play in the twos he's not going to be happy no but and if you but if you tip a player out who's playing your role and playing it as well as you expect it to be played right now mm. and they play twos they're not going to be happy just because one's on I don't know, 850 and the others on 350, that doesn't mean they're going to be any more or less disappointed for not playing ones or two. So you, you, you've got to treat it. You've got to treat every person equally, regardless of the contract that they're on treat first and on foremost. Yeah. And you've got to reward them for what they're contributing to the team, regardless of the contract that they're on. The due diligence that goes into potentially recruiting another player, um, the, the background work that you do on that. Is it more gut feel? Is it scientific? How in-depth is it? Or is it just more a coach meeting with a player and, and backing that player in? We, we're referencing it because of, of Jordan Ngoi, and I sort of said last night that Geelong feels like a good spot for him, but you would have been involved in conversations about getting a player from another club that perhaps hasn't yeah. done everything right in the past. What goes into it? Um, well, I think the first thing is is to – is to try and get a sense of that person and and you know where they want to go in their in their footy, um, where they're at in their life, and and whether they feel like. And the other thing you want you need to do is actually unpack mm. you know the the scrutiny that that has come and and what actually the reality of the events underneath, because um, that's not always what what is publicly reported is not always accurate to mm. to what has happened underneath. Um, I think I mean a really good example at the moment is Tyson Stengel to to Geelong, and there were we we did a Collingwood did a great deal of due diligence on Stengel yeah. and and were really keen on looking at him. We had a look at him in the mid season draft yeah. last year. Um, I think what Geelong have done really well is you know worked out that Stengel and, and Eddie Betts were were nearly a you know tag team. They were, they, they had yeah. to come in together. Um, and that has been, you know, the, the fruits of that are, are more than obvious. And Stengel looks really settled. He looks like he's got great support and a, and a great confidant in Eddie in the coaching panel. He's living with him. Mm. He's thriving and his talent is coming to the fore. The other thing that we that we often overlook is he might – he's gone along a journey and he's learned 
from his mistakes. He's reached a level of maturity that he didn't have two years ago or five years ago. So there is a natural evolution. Some, some people will get there. Some people won't get there. But there's all credit has to go to him, not mm. just to Geelong. So it is a little bit of right place, right time for Geelong, but they put the right um, support mechanisms around the player. But the player himself is the one that makes the decisions, mm. puts his effort in, gets the reward, and then feels like, wow, I'm on the right path. So it's self-fulfilling. You start putting more effort in, more reward. You buy into it even more, and then and then you're off. Mm. And that's clearly what it looks like with Stengel. So there's, there's some self-development um, and improvement that happens as we mature as people. And I think qu- too quickly we, we actually give up on you know, talented individuals that are just going through a patch where – they're learning about themselves, understanding what the what the profession is requiring mm. of them. 